This training session will provide you with an overview of special education law in the District of Columbia. The legal authority for special education law in D.C. comes from the federal statute, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, also known as IDEA or IDEA. In addition, there are the federal regulations that implement the, that statute found at 34 Code of Federal Regulations Parts 300 and 301 and Part 303. The local regulations in D.C. are found at Title V of the D.C. Municipal Regulations and we also practice under the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, Student Hearing Office, standard operating procedures, as well as policies promulgated by DC Public Schools and OSSI. So what is special education? The statute defines special education as specially designed instruction provided at no cost to the parent that meets the unique needs of a child with disability. Now special education can include specialized instruction, which is instruction provided by special education teachers. It can also include what's called related services, so speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy. It can also include counseling services. It can include travel training or vocational training. And special education can also include classroom modifications and accommodations, depending on what that child's needs are. The federal statute is meant to ensure that all children with disabilities receive what's called a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. The children that are covered under this statute are children ages 0 through 22. So Part C of the statute covers the infants and toddlers ages 0 through 2, and Part B of the statute covers children ages uh, 3 through 22. Now I'm going to break down um, some terms for you uh, that are important to remember because you're going to be seeing them throughout your practice. Um, the first one is free and appropriate public education, which we term, uh, call FAPE. Uh, the definition of FAPE is special education and related services that are provided at no charge to the parent, that meets the standards of the state education agency, so here in D.C., meets the standards of OSSI and is designed to meet the individual needs of the child to ensure that the child makes educational progress. In addition, special education and related services needs to be provided in conformity with that child's individualized education program, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, one important thing to note here is that the law is very clear that the progress contemplated here is not trivial. A child, in order for a, a child to be receiving an appropriate education, the child must make meaningful educational progress. Another term that is important to remember is, is called child find. And it's a comprehensive and straightforward mandate that states that DC must ensure that all children with disabilities who live in DC and who are in need of special education and related services are identified, located, and evaluated. And this mandate applies regardless of the child's disability, regardless of the severity of the child's disability. Um, it also includes children who aren't attending school yet, so children who are too young to attend school or who aren't attending school for other reasons. It includes homeless children. It includes children who are wards of the district because they are in the abuse or neglect system. And it also applies to children who are attending private schools, um, religious schools, or public charter schools. Another important term to remember is individualized education program. And that's essentially the written plan that sets forth what the child's educational program is going to look like and what services the educational program is going to include. It is the centerpiece of the student's educational delivery system. The next term to remember is, is what we call LRE, or Least Restrictive Environment. And this term captures a key aspect of special education law. Essentially, it, it, it states that to the maximum extent appropriate, 
children with disabilities should be educated with their regular education peers in their neighborhood school. The concept of least restrictive environment addresses the historical segregation of children with disabilities who used to be sent to institutions or residential facilities for their education. The focus of this law is that children are able to receive their education in their neighborhood school. The only reason a child shouldn't receive their education in their neighborhood school is if that neighborhood school is unable to meet the child's individual needs. The next part of this training is going to focus on the steps to follow to secure special education for a child. The first step is referral. In order to be evaluated for special education, a child with a suspected disability must first be referred for an evaluation. A child can be referred by a parent, which happens frequently. Uh, it, the child can be referred by a teacher or another staff member at the child's school. Uh, the child, him or herself, can also refer himself or herself for an evaluation if he or she's 18 or older. Um, and employees of other state agencies in D.C. can also refer a child for a special education evaluation. So maybe an employee of Department of Mental Health or an employee of Child and Family, or an employee of Child and Family Services may also refer a child for a special education evaluation. In terms of how referrals are made, it's actually very simple and straightforward. The referral should be made in writing. The referral should be made in writing to the principal of the school that the child is attending. The referral should include the date of the referral and a very simple statement as to why the person writing the letter thinks the child needs to be evaluated for special education services. The request should also include the signature and contact information for the person making the referral. Now for children who are under age three, who are infants and toddlers, the referral actually should be made to the Early Intervention Office, which is run out of OSSI, the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. For children ages three through five, the referral should be made to the Office of Early Stages. When, once a referral is made, the school is supposed to hold what's called a multidisciplinary team meeting. Um, this meeting needs to happen before the school conducts evaluations. At this meeting, the school should review current information about the child. So, for example, report cards, progress reports, standardized test results. Um, the parent may bring in uh, examples of homework or work that the child is doing at home. If the parent has outside evaluations that have been conducted by other medical providers, those would be appropriate to discuss and review at this meeting as well. What should happen at the meeting then after the discussion takes place about what the child's needs are is the, a student evaluation plan should be created. And the members of the multidisciplinary team need to explain to the parent what evaluations are being recommended. And before the evaluations are conducted, the school must obtain informed parental consent. Who is a member of this multidisciplinary team or IEP team? The parent is a, a mandatory member of the team. In addition, the special education teacher needs to be present. An individual who interprets evaluation results needs to be there other people who the parent might want to attend, so a family member, or if the parent has counsel, of course the attorney um, should be there. Um, and the school system might invite somebody who has special expertise regarding the child to attend the meeting as well. Um, the child, if appropriate, is also a member of the team. And a critical member of the team is also somebody from the school district who has knowledge about what programs are available throughout the school system and who's knowledgeable about the resources available within the school system and who's also qualified to supervise the provision of special education. Step number two in the process is evaluation. The school district, the LEA, so either DC public schools or an independent charter school, 
is responsible for conducting a comprehensive and individualized evaluation in order to determine first whether the child has a disability and then second whether or not that child needs special education services. So it is a two-pronged approach. Uh, the law in DC allows the school district 120 days to complete the evaluation. In federal law, schools have 60 days to complete the evaluation, but uh, in DC, uh, the school system actually has 120 days to complete these evaluations. The next slide shows shows you common types of evaluations. I'm not going to go over all of them now, but very uh, common ones are the psychoeducational evaluation, which tests a child's cognitive abilities as well as their academic achievement. Also a clinical psychological evaluation, which in addition to testing a child's cognitive abilities and academic achievement, also looks at a child's social, social and emotional functioning. Other evaluations that are common in the cases that we handle are speech and language evaluations and occupational therapy evaluations. Um, in terms of step number three, this is when the IEP team, IEP team determines whether or not a child is actually eligible to receive special education. Again, the school needs to convene a meeting. At the meeting, uh, the evaluations that were conducted need to be reviewed and somebody at the meeting needs to understand what evaluations were conducted and be able to explain those evaluations to the parent. The team must determine if the, ch must determine if the child is a child with a disability and if that disability is actually impacting the child's ability to make progress in the school setting. Now, when making this eligibility determination, the team is going to look at those evaluations that were conducted, but is also going to look at other information that's available uh, about the child. So again, the, the team will look at other evaluations that the parent had conducted outside of the school setting. We'll look at just information that the parent can provide about how the child functions at home or in the community. The teacher might provide examples of how the child is doing um, in the classroom. There might also be results of standardized tests that are looked at, as well as other observations by other teachers or other school staff. On this slide, you can see the enumerated disabilities under the law. The, I'm going to highlight a couple of them because they are the, the, the most common ones that we see in the cases that we handle and in the cases that, that you might handle as a pro bono attorney. The uh, most common disability classifications are learning disability and emotional disturbance. The other one I want to highlight is other health impairment, which is sort of a, a catch-all classification. It, um, it captures those students that have um, diagnoses such as ADHD or sickle cell or other chronic health impairments that affect their ability to, to function during the school day. Um, once it's determined whether or not a child has a disability and requires special education, the next step is, is figuring out whether or not the parent actually agrees with that assessment. If a parent disagrees with the school's evaluation for any reason, the parent has a right to request what's called an independent educational evaluation. Now these independent educational evaluations or IEEs are paid for by the school system. The parent doesn't need to provide a reason for the, their disagreement. The school system is responsible for paying for one of these evaluations if the parent disagrees. Now if the school system actually disagrees with the parent's request for an IEE, they have two choices. They can go ahead and fund it anyway, or they can file a due process complaint on their own against the parent to prove the appropriateness of the school system's evaluation. And to be frank, we have not had any experience where the school system filed a complaint against the parent denying an independent educational evaluation. 
Um, furthermore, at any time throughout the special education process, and we're going to get into this later, the parent can request mediation or can file a due process complaint. Step four of the special education process is the development of the individualized education program. The IEP is developed by, again, the MDT slash IEP team. The IEP is the written document that sets forth all of the child's educational programming, what the child needs in order to make educational progress. The IEP should, should include the child's present level of performance, information on, the, on how the child's disability affects his or her involvement and progress in a general education setting. The IEP needs to have measurable annual goals and objectives. It will also describe the levels and types of special education and related services, supplementary aids and services and modifications. So for example, this is where it will, if the child needs speech and language therapy, the IEP will indicate the frequency and duration of the, special, of the speech therapy that's needed for that child. It's also going to include, or it should include an explanation of the extent to which the child will not participate with their non-disabled peers in the regular education classroom. And the IEP also needs to include any accommodations that are required for standardized testing. Now in terms of related services, I did mention an example of uh, speech and language therapy. Other, other examples of related services are occupational therapy, which helps children that have difficulties with their fine motor skills, or physical therapy for children that have issues with gross motor skills. Um, other related services include counseling services, so uh, counseling by a psychologist or a, a guidance counselor, uh, other behavioral support services, transportation services. IEP can, the IEP can also include training for the parent. Um, and as well as medical services. So for example, specific nursing services may, may be included on the IEP for those children that have disabilities that involve a medical component. The next slide shows examples of accommodations and modifications, as well as other supplementary aids and services. Um, a dedicated aid is, is a, a service that we see um, on IEPs somewhat frequently with the families that we work with. So for children that require one-to-one -one assistance, a dedicated aid will be something that's put on the IEP so that the child is able to have somebody in the classroom with him or her at all times assisting with uh, the child being able to access the classroom. The uh, other, another popular accommodation that we see with our the families that we work with is special seating, something very simple such as making sure the child is sitting at the front of the classroom. Um, in, in addition, there's adaptive furniture, whether that be a special slanted desk or a special type of pen or other types of, um, of modifications like a fidget cushion, something that a child with ADHD can sit on to help with their, their ability to, or their inability rather, to sit still. Uh, in addition, other modifications might include extra time for tests, or breaks during testing or, or class. Um, in addition, the IEP can get very specific about what time of day is appropriate to test the child. Um, the IEP also includes addendums. Um, addendums to the IEP are listed on this slide. The most popular one is transportation. So children with disabilities who require transportation to and from schools need to have it spelled out on their individualized education program that they require it. So this, this addendum will include reasons why the child needs the transportation and will include the child's address, the school's address, and the instructions for how that transportation is to take place. In addition, another addendum to the IEP is the behavior intervention plan. So for children with social and emotional problems, they may require the creation of a behavior intervention plan, and that's something that needs to be included on the IEP.
for children ages 16 and older, the IEP also needs to include what's called a transition plan. Now the transition plan is referencing what a child will do, or I should say what a young man or young woman will do after they leave high school. So the transition plan should talk about job training, should talk about uh, creating a resume, should talk about employment, or if a child is uh, a child that is more is working more on independent living skills then that transition plan needs to spell out what that child is going to work on in order to be able to function independently when they leave high school. Step five of the special education process is placement. Now once again uh, in order to discuss placement the school needs to convene an MDT slash IEP meeting. Now this meeting can happen separately from the meeting where the child's IEP is created or it can happen at the same time. Placement is based, needs to be based on the individual needs of the child and the placement decision needs to consider the IEP as well as the least restrictive environment requirements. Again, placement is a decision that needs to be made by a group of people, not just one person on the team. And the parent is a critical member of that team, and the parent's voice is one that's very important at this placement determination phase. Placement needs to be determined at least annually, and the law also indicates that placement must be as close as possible to the child's home. Now one thing to think about here is that term as close as possible. If the neighborhood school is not able to meet that child's needs, then a school that is farther away is perfectly acceptable as an option for that child. Now this next slide talks about what's called the continuum of placements. So we start with instruction in regular classes. This is, you know, children with special needs who are receiving special education in the regular education classroom. So you might hear the term inclusion or push in. That is special education that's actually delivered within the regular education classroom. The next on the continuum is instruction in special classes. You'll hear the term uh, pull out here where children are actually pulled out of their regular education classrooms and taught in a separate classroom for whatever subject area um, they are required to get, receive special education in. So say for example a child with a learning disability in reading and written expression they may be pulled out for their English class and they may be pulled out for a special reading class. Um, and the children that are pulled out for special classes it, it can range from being pulled out just for one or two hours a day to actually being pulled out for several hours a day. Uh, next on the continuum is our special schools where a child spends their entire day in a school that's geared towards serving children with special needs. So this is what's termed a full-time special education placement. There will be no contact with children uh, with regular education peers because it's a school that is uh, in existence to serve children with disabilities. And it can be a public school, so DCPS has, has special schools geared towards children with disabilities that require a full-time special education placement, or it can be a non-public school as well. Next on the continuum is uh, home instruction. So this is where a child may have a medical condition or a chronic health condition that requires them to stay at home and special education can be delivered uh, at home. There, in, within DCPS it's called Visiting Instruction Services and it can take place over the course of days, weeks, or months depending on the child's medical needs. And finally, for children who are unable to function in the community who either um, are not able to to be safe in the community or who have medical or health conditions that require them to be hospitalized. 
special education instruction can actually occur in hospitals or in residential facilities. And moving to the next step along the process is the IEP review. So once an IEP is created for a child, that IEP isn't going to follow that child. That, that particular IEP is not going to follow the child throughout their education. It's something, it's a living document. It's something that needs to be reviewed at least annually. And in many cases, in many families that we work with, the IEP is actually reviewed on a more frequent basis if, if something is happening in the child's school life that warrants it. Uh, for example, if a child is regressing or in a certain academic area, or if a child is having uh, increased behavioral problems, or if a child has made great progress and the goals need to be revisited. Those are all good reasons why an IEP might be uh, reviewed uh, more frequently than just annually. And the thing to remember is that a parent can request an IE IEP review at any time, and the school also has the, has the right to um, request an IEP meeting at any time if they see the need as well. Step seven of the process is reevaluation. The law requires that a child who receives special education services must be reevaluated in all areas of suspected disability every three years unless all members of the IEP MDT team agree that it's not necessary. Uh, the thing to remember here is that the school is not permitted to unilaterally decide not to reevaluate a child. Uh, if a child, if the, the team and the parent agree that the child does not need to be reevaluated, re that's something that needs to be documented in the child's school records. And, and similarly to a parent being able to request IEP review at any time, a parent can request that a child be reevaluated at any time if they feel that it's necessary. And a teacher or another school staff member can also request reevaluation at any time. Of course, that reevaluation does require that the parent consent to that to those evaluations being conducted. Now the next slide goes over some procedural requirements for the provision of FAPE, for the provision of uh, free and appropriate public education. Um, the, the school district needs to make sure parents know what's going on. They need to provide them with a copy of, of the procedural safeguards. They need to allow parents to review or obtain copies of their child's educational records. Uh, a critical component of special education law is the parent's ability to meaningfully participate in the special education process. So that means that a parent is a critical member of the IEP team in terms of creating the IEP, talking about what their child's needs are, and having a voice in, in where their, their child will be going to school. The school system also needs to provide prior written notice when they propose to when they propose something for a child or when they deny something for a child or when they terminate something that a child is already receiving. If any of these decisions are made by the school system, they are required under law to issue what's called prior written notice, so explaining to the parent the reasons for that decision. Um, the school system also is required to provide the parent with an opportunity for mediation as well as the opportunity to file a complaint. Um, and those procedural requirements in regards to litigating and filing a due process complaint, those things will be discussed in a, a later training session. Um, prior written, this slide discusses in more detail what prior written notice must include. And we do highlight this procedural requirements be, because it is, it's one that is so critical for parents because it's what explains to them why the school system is acting in one way or another. And it's often an area where, in our experience, the school system is not doing a great job. Parents are confused about why decisions are made 
and they don't understand why their child is not receiving certain services. This prior written notice is important for parents for that reason so that they can understand what is going on. This next slide lists out different legal violations that you might see in the special education case that you handle. So you have on one hand procedural issues such as a timeline violation. So you may recall that the school system has 120 days to conduct initial evaluations of a child suspected of having a disability. If it's 121 days, 130 days, a year, that's a timeline violation. Uh, the other procedural issues are notice to parents or not allowing a parent to meaningfully participate in the process. Uh, if an IEP team is con if an IEP meeting is convened and the team does not include mandatory members, that's a procedural violation. So for example, an IEP, IEP meeting, an IEP meeting is held and the special education teacher is not present for that meeting. That is not procedurally legal. In addition, another procedural uh, violation would be implementation of the IEP or timeliness of other evaluations such as the reevaluation. Now, on the other hand, we have substantive issues where a child is not making meaningful progress. You'll see IEP implementation is either a procedural violation or a substantive violation. If the IEP is not implemented and it's having a negative impact on that child making progress, then that becomes substantive. If uh, the child's placement is not appropriate, that's clearly a substantive issue. Now, a procedural violation is equal to a denial of a free and appropriate public education when it impedes that child's right to FAPE, meaning that if the child's not making educational progress because of one of these procedural violations, well then that equals a denial of FAPE and that becomes substantive. In addition, if a parent's opportunity to participate in the decision-making process regarding the, um, his or her child's education, special education, then that's also considered denial of the child's right to a FAPE. And if at any point a procedural violation results in a child being deprived educational benefits, that is harm and that is a substantive issue. Now the next few slides are, are going to address the situation when students with disabilities get in trouble at school. Um, one thing to note is that students with disabilities do have special protections in disciplinary matters and a student with a disability is always entitled to that FAPE, to that free and appropriate public education and can never be excluded from receiving that education. Now, these protections, these extra protections for children with disabilities in disciplinary matters are also covering children who are not yet identified, but, but the school system should have known they had a disability and needed services. Or these um, protections also cover children who have an IEP, but the school system wasn't implementing that IEP. So what are the protections? The, a child with disabilities cannot be excluded from class, cannot be excluded from school for more than 10 school days. If a child is excluded from class for more than 10 school days over the course of a school year, that is considered a change in educational placement. And when there is a change in educational placement for a child with a disability, the school must hold a meeting to determine whether or not the behavior that resulted in the child getting in trouble is a manifestation of the, of the student's disability. And this meeting needs, this manifestation determination meeting needs to take place whether it's been 10 consecutive days, so if a child was suspended for 10 days all at once, or if a child was suspended for two days here and there but it totals 10 days, 
the school is required to hold this manifestation determination meeting. And if it is a manifestation of the child's disability and or as a result of the school's failure to provide appropriate services or implement the child's IEP, then the suspension or the expulsion is not legal and cannot take place. So, so what is this manifestation determination? It's another meeting at the school where the IEP team gets together to determine if the behavior that led to the disciplinary action is substantially related to the child's disability. So the IEP team, it's going to be similar to what happens at a regular IEP team meeting. The team needs to look at all relevant information, including evaluations, observations of the child, information provided by the parent, needs to look at the current IEP and what the educational placement is. And in addition, the team needs to look at the IEP and determine whether or not it's appropriate, whether the placement's appropriate, and look at whether the IEP is actually being properly implemented. And the critical piece here is that at this meeting, which is being held because the child was suspended or expelled from school, the team needs to figure out whether the child's disability impaired the ability of that child to understand the consequences of his or her behavior and also determine whether or not the child's uh, disability impaired the child's ability to control that behavior. If the team answers yes to any of those questions, the behavior that led to the disciplinary action is deemed to be a manifestation of the child's disability and the disciplinary action is not legal and must be rescinded. So if, if a child with an emotional disturbance is suspended for getting into a fight and the IEP team meets and goes over these factors and it's determined that one, the psychological counseling that's supposed to be happening has not been implemented all year long and determines that in addition to the IEP not being implemented that the child's social emotional functioning makes it so that he's not able to understand the consequences of his behavior or he just could not control the behavior due to a severe problem with impulse control the the answer to the manifestation determination is that yes this behavior was a manifestation of the child's disability and that suspension cannot stand. In addition, uh, in a situation like this, the school must conduct what's called a functional behavior assessment which looks at uh, the child's behavior and what causes a child to behave in a certain way and then from that functional behavior assessment the team should create what's called a behavior intervention plan, which you learned was an, uh, an addendum to the IEP for some children. And if the child already has a behavior intervention plan, it's probably not working, in which case the team needs to come up with a new behavior intervention plan. And the, the final thing that needs to happen, if, if the child's, if this behavior is determined to be a manifestation of the child's disability, the child needs to be able to be returned to school. If the team answers no to all of the questions, then that means the team has decided that the child's behavior was not a manifestation of the child's disability. Therefore, the child can be disciplined as, would, as a child without special needs would be disciplined, meaning that if the child was suspended and the behavior was not a manifestation of the child's disability, that suspension will stand. Or if the child was expelled and the behavior is deemed not to be a manifestation of the child's disability, then that expulsion can stand. If a parent disagrees with the actions of the school in any one of the areas that we talked about today, so in any of the steps along the way, going from referral for evaluations to evaluations to eligibility determination to the IEP creation or reevaluation in regards to educational placement or discipline 
the parents may take various steps to remedy that disagreement. Parents have the opportunity throughout any step of the special education process to attempt to remedy their disagreement. They can request an independent educational evaluation. They can simply request that the school convene another IEP or MDT team meeting where they can voice their concerns about what's going on at school or what's not going on at school. Parents can also request mediation. And finally, parents can also request a due process hearing by filing a complaint. Now, one final thing to note regard, regarding filing a due process complaint is that during the pendency of that litigation process, a parent has what's called stay put rights, meaning that they have the right to maintain, maintain their child's current educational placement and program until a decision has been reached. Later training sessions are going to go into more detail about how parents can file complaints and how they can request mediation. And I want to have, uh, make one final reminder that if you do take a special education case pro bono, that you have the opportunity at any time to contact your children's law center mentor if you need help with strategizing, you need help with filing a complaint, you need help figuring out who to talk to at the school, or if you have questions about any step along the way, you are free to contact Children's Law Center for help. Thank you.